You're listening to the Rewilding Earth Podcast. The Rewilding Earth Podcast is supported by businesses such as Patagonia and Catula, the Whedon Foundation, and listeners like you. If you love the work Rewilding is doing, please consider donating at rewilding.org. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast while you're there. Bob Leverett is the co-founder of Native Tree Society, co-founder and president of Friends of Mohawk Trail State Forest, chairperson for the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation Forest Reserve Scientific Advisory Committee, and co-author of the American Forest Champion Tree Measuring Guidelines Handbook. He is also co-author of several books, including the Sierra Club Guide to Ancient Forests of the Northeast. Educated as an engineer, Bob is a recognized expert in the science of measuring trees for both science and sport. His association with old-growth forest discoveries and confirmations dates to the middle 1980s. This compelling interest placed him in the center of the early old-growth preservation movements, which continue to this day. I began the interview by asking Bob about his early days, the Native Tree Society, and being a tree hunter. Being a tree hunter in the more traditional sense of a trophy is really not where I have been. Uh, I I do hunt trees, but it's more uh, for the purpose of identifying important ecological niches uh, that older trees and older forests serve, and to document them in terms of their internal stand or individual tree statistics to a far higher degree of accuracy than often comes out of what you get when you're looking at uh, timber management plans or whatever. That got me started years ago measuring trees and old growth forests here in western Massachusetts uh, that were, were really not even recognized as old growth and it took a long time to get that sorted out. But I, as a, as a background, I was educated as an engineer and in the Air Force, that's a purpose that I served and, and a mathematician of some sort. So I come into it really very intensively from the numeric aspect, as well as qualitatively. I mean, the spiritual values are all there and, and I'm totally sensitive to them, but just to distinguish myself from a, a person who is by their own description, a big tree hunter, I probably really don't fit that. Let's let's also kind of uh, get an idea of the work that you're doing now as it as it pertains to the ecological state of the union for old growth forests. Like where do you fit into that now? What is your main purpose? Yes, my main purpose is, is certainly continuing to find them and, and working of course with Joan and, and for the purposes that she will describe so eloquently, they have values. Uh, But my purpose also is to bring a a, a higher level of numeric understanding to what these older forests and trees bring us. And most recently, I'm almost totally involved with the carbon sequestration issue. That is to say the older trees and uh, usually that encompasses bigger trees, at least relative to the same growing conditions elsewhere, hold a lot more carbon than their younger forest counterparts. In addition to that, unbeknownst to many and often misportrayed by many, younger forests do not sequester more carbon uh, more rapidly than the larger, older forests. Uh, and it's easy to explain why. But that once people understand that, then the value of the older forests go skyrockets. It's oh, no yeah. longer about oh yeah they're beautiful and you know they're they have some habitat value and whatnot. But they're sort of just standing there, marking time until they die. A kind of a geriatric home for old trees, and uh, actually they're very dynamic places. So sometimes when we talk about old growth and we use that term. It, it it can have a pejorative context, at least in, in the context of forest management, and, and often in the past uh, was described by terms like over-mature or diseased and decadent, and that is just so untrue, and, and it so undervalues and understates what the contribution of these places are. 
But the carbon part of it is really fairly new. I mean, most people who were involved in, well, forest management, that sort of thing, but forest ecologists also, uh, who were studying more from a successional standpoint or an overall what is it and how did it evolve, a lot of, of the information would suggest that once trees get up old in the east, for example, over 100 years old, maybe, you know, 100 somewhere in that, that they, they kind of, they've, they've done their job. They're, they're really ready to retire. And we're not going to get much out of them in terms of carbon. That is totally wrong. It, it, it would certainly bolster arguments for, you know, further arguments for protecting old growth. Uh, where <laughs> Absolutely. It's I mean, I can't help but bring up the actual discussion that's happening right now. Um, you see on Twitter all kinds of reports, all kinds of pointing to different articles about how the Forest Service is actually abusing such notions and also in relation to fire damage, uh, also in relation to demonstrably false information about uh, disease and, and other things where the Forest Service is saying they pretty much now have carte blanche in some areas to take out any number of trees they wish in, under the guise of protecting against disease, protecting against fire. It's a very difficult landscape out there. It's a difficult world out there when, when there's someone like you who knows more about the truth than, than <laughs> the vast majority of anybody else out there your voice is not being heard enough. And for, and I've not seen you on CNN. I've not seen you or people like you uh, with your kind of background being given a voice. What's it like to sit in your position and see these things going on? And then after that, what what do you feel we can do about it? How can we support people like you? How can we get you or people like you a seat at the table again, which we used to have more of than I feel that like we do now? Well, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, I don't feel in any way singled out that I'm not sitting at the table. Uh, some of my really top-notch scientist friends who are on the cutting edge of the research that shows the value, let's say, to carbon sequestration of larger and older trees, they don't get a seat at the table either. They are pretty much pushed out, and that's politics, and that's the the power of of lobbies, and I, so I, I, am I frustrated in it? Yes, in a general way, but not in a personal way. Over the years, I've had a fair amount of exposure uh, in settings, for example, conferences and that sort of thing, and we're in fact organizing a new conference at Williams College uh, in Western Massachusetts that'll be on old growth forests and, and their value in carbon sequestration for probably October uh, 2019. It'll have uh, you know a stellar group of scientists, and there'll be forest managers there. Will the word get out to a wider audience? Well, I don't know. I I expect it only to a limited degree. You know, we have to remember if if we're looking for a simple explanation that the forest products and timber industry and the people who are the managers, to include professional foresters, include loggers, include mill owners and whatnot, if they don't cut trees on a very regular basis and have control over large swaths of forest, they don't have a profession, they don't have a business, they have to convince the public that there are benefits to rapid or short-term rotations to, to uh, stands of trees, that sort of thing, they have to come up with a lot of green speak or green wash, or they don't simply have uh, a, a continuing role in the future of the forest that they have to control if they're going to have their professions work. The Forest Service has never been any different. There's a lot of good scientists who I know in the Forest Service that aren't particularly happy with the direction that the Forest Service is going, but this is directed, you know, from the very highest levels mm. of government, and you know what we've got now. And, and therefore, uh, it's not at all surprising to me that the, the direction is flipped. Under uh, Jack Lord Thomas and Michael Dombeck, the, the Forest Service was getting into a real role of being custodians of the forest uh, instead of exploiters of it. But we're back to the exploitation model, 
And uh, the worst case of it, of, of all, is biofuels. There is no bloody way that car uh, biofuels are carbon neutral. I mean, I'm talking about the tree part of that, uh, I'm not addressing other fuels that are biological in nature, but just cutting trees and burning them, you, you almost have to be totally out to lunch to believe that carbon uh, uh, biofuels that way are carbon neutral. And yet, from a political standpoint, look at how many organizations, even countries, have bought into that. Well, that's because, <laughs> you know, at, at the upper levels, uh, they're bought off. And underneath, the population really just is surviving or doesn't know. And that's the big story that we have to continue to, to hammer out. I mean, look at what's happening in places like Indonesia, where uh, palm oil is justifying to them absolutely eliminating huge swaths of superb old growth forests that harbor, you know, incredible animal species like orangutans and what have you that wouldn't be in any kind of a plantation, certainly don't evolve from that kind of, a, of an environment. And yet that's happening. And then you have the case of uh, Brazil and eliminating huge swaths of incredibly important forest habitat. So some of the people that I am starting to work with include uh, the scientists, and, and you know, I'm very peripheral to that, but starting at Woods Hole Research Center in uh, Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And, uh, and, and others are academics uh, in, in, in research facilities like Harvard Forest. My role in all of that is to try to, to develop better data at the local level, at the stand level, at the individual tree level, <clears throat> that explains how younger trees do not hold more carbon and are not growing faster in the context of of absolute storage of carbon as opposed to percentage growth than their older counterparts. So I've carved out for myself a fairly uh, limited uh, swath or, or role, but it's one in which it's starting to gain traction. And I've got a lot of people who say, holy smoke, you know, we, we sort of went with the common belief that <clears throat> young early successional habitats do in fact sequester more carbon. Well, heck, you can look at a little seedling or sapling and ask yourself if you've got half of a brain how could that be holding the kind of carbon that's in a tree that's a uh, hundred feet tall and eight foot in circumference well <clears throat> i don't know how they do it. well i do know how do they do it i thought about it a lot as to how they can come to a conclusion that is a hundred percent wrong but that story is the one i'm really currently well shall we say obsessed with as you're talking about that, that you it begs the question, the number one most glaring alarm bell that's going off right now, in my mind, is there are places like, um, I mean, all over the world, there's, there's neat initiatives going on. India did the planting of a billion trees or some, something like that. I didn't follow the story closely enough, but there's also Conservation International who is making a big deal right now about their multi-million dollar tree planting or multi-million tree planting operation in the Amazon. And I get excited about those things. I look at it in a rewilding issue as an overall thing that is a good thing, you know, for the planet at least. But when you say that young trees, young forests, what you say about them in, in terms of their ability to hold carbon being much different than what we've all, you know, kind of been told or led to believe if we, lived, if we looked into it at all. I don't want that to be depressing. I don't want people to, to, so, and I know you have an answer for that. So tell me why it's still exciting when the trees have been removed in a vast territory, like in the Brazilian rainforest or someplace, that it's still a good thing and it still has its place even in a carbon situation, maybe in the long term? Uh, I'm, I'm a senior advisor to American Forest, the organization that is on uh, tree measuring for championship programs and that sort of thing. And I also am increasingly becoming a voice in their <clears throat> carbon program. They are, you know, out there uh, uh, in, in, on the front lines with replanting uh, initiatives. I'm totally for that. 
and and I take pride and solace, I guess, in knowing that there are people out there that are trying to make that kind of a difference in the short term, where we're talking about 30 to 50 years or Mm -hmm. 25 to 50 years. We need to hold on to the bigger, older trees in the, the forest because they are where the action is. It's going to take those young trees a long time to get to the point where they're adding the kind of carbon that people think they're adding. So even though it's a great initiative and it's inspiring to me too, to see people put that kind of heart and effort into it, I worry sometimes though that we don't want to get our attention too diverted that if we're doing the plantings, then we're offsetting the loss of the other. We are not. It's it, the problem with, is I would call it numeracy. People who become overwhelmed by big numbers and statistics in the hope that a simple phrase or a simple talking point will give them traction, it doesn't happen that way. <clears throat> Number one, a lot of times when forests are replanted with the intention of you know, on the part of somebody, somebody in that will say, well, okay, we plant them now. We're, we, we've we got a clear conscience because we're going to grow these trees and they will grow fast. And yes, they do grow fast. It's just you're taking a big percentage of this very small stem and that doesn't add up to very much carbon on a per tree basis. But over time, they would catch up. But we're talking between 50 and 100 years before uh, the carbon debt from what they took out would be paid off if it's paid off even then. But what tends to happen is that they don't leave those stands alone to grow into bigger trees that then speed up in terms of the absolute carbon that they hold. They have some plan and they cut them down and you're right back to square one again. And they so whatever you get in the first say 40 or 50 years build up of the carbon, that's as much as you're ever going to get standing. Mm. Uh, and and then you of course, have as an average about half of that that you're talking about at any one given time uh, on that acre. Well, if you're talking about an old forest, you would have multiple times that on the acre. So if you just look at a footprint of how much carbon are you storing on an acre for this area or that, for this kind of forest or that, for this kind of species or that, then it doesn't work out to be what they thought that it would be. And it isn't to say that they shouldn't be doing it. It isn't to say that once we've got this open area that was whatever happened to it, another group of people come in with pure motives and want to try to, you know, uh, correct some of the damage. There's nothing that I'm saying or believe that I would try to discourage them from doing that. But looking at it from a more distant perch, the value of what they're doing relative to what we lost it's not what they often think that it is. And, and part of that is, again, uh, the numbers. <clears throat> Here's an example. You can go out on the inter- internet and say, well, okay, you know, let, let me see what the value of me, uh, my tree in the front yard is, carbon-wise. What, what's it doing? What am I doing personally by having that tree there uh, in terms of uh, climate mitigation? And you might find a figure like, well, a mature tree stores or pulls out of the air, basically out of the atmosphere, uh, 48 pounds of carbon dioxide per tree per year. So you you take 48 pounds and you say, okay, then that's the value of my quote unquote mature tree. Holy Moses, I can go into the Western Mass here and some of these older pine stands and find individual trees that in one year, they add or pull basically out of the atmosphere over 300 pounds of carbon dioxide. And then of course you pull a molecule of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, that carbon atom goes into the trunk and then eventually the oxygen part of it gets released. So you get oxygen is is a benefit from it, but you also get the carbon storage uh, of it. And uh, where did they come up with 48? Well, I've been trying to, to to uncover that or trace that down, and all I can come up with, Jack, is that maybe that's the value of that young ornamental pear tree that you planted 10 or 15 years ago in your front yard, and you want to feel or at least know what it's doing, but it isn't doing the work of one of those pines that already is standing. And so now if we go forward and we say, okay, 
here's this oak in my front yard, and it's uh, oh about 75 years old or something like that. Uh, and I'm a little worried about it <laughs> falling on my house. So uh, maybe I ought to take it down. But I'm also thinking about the climate. And uh, maybe if I take it down, but, oh, yeah, I'll replant one of these young trees. And golly, it'll, it'll grow real fast, and it'll do the work of the old one. No. It does not. No, no I have a, is, I, my kid brought a, an oak home for Arbor Day <laughs> one time. And uh, I mean, when in the fall, it sheds about 10 leaves now. That's how big it is. And it's been about four or five years. And we also just had a pretty big mess in our backyard from the previous owner who had planted uh, Bradford pears. And those things oh, only gosh. for the blink of an eye. I know everybody yeah, has a there. weed reaction to those trees and they, and the rings and, and, on these and things. And rightly so. And yeah. Rightly so. The rings on these things are the biggest rings I've ever seen in a tree species before in my life. They were almost three quarters of an inch and, and they were, uh, we counted them. There's about 14 or 15 years on each one of the three trees. They're all gone now. That's all the longer they live. They, they busted my fence and everything else up this winter yeah. or this fall already. And uh, I swore I was never going to. And then we, I was like, what are what the rings of a tree that grows that fast looks like? And I couldn't believe it. It was huge. And I'm like, these, I don't know what these trees were doing for uh, carbon or um, much of anything else, but they grew really fast and they made you feel like you might be. I, I felt like I was doing something. I'm like, those trees are, you know, they're growing so fast, they must be using a lot of carbon to do so. Well, that, they do. They do. And, and that, that isn't to say that that tree, for the particular circumstances that you or someone might have planted it, wouldn't have been a good idea. And, and, and to be poo-hooed, uh, no, I, I'm not doing that. But let's take, for example, a, a tree that's, uh, oh, a foot in, in uh, diameter. And let's say we have a ring uh, that's the outermost ring that's added the next year. And let's say that it's uh, a, a quarter of an inch in diameter. If, if you then had a tree that was basically just, we're talking about cross-sectional area, and you had a tree now that's instead of a foot in diameter, you had it two feet in diameter, then the ring would only be, have to be half as wide you know, 1.125 inches as opposed to 0.25 inches in order to create the same cross-sectional area added on. Now, I think mm. in terms of a small tree that's only about six inches in diameter versus one that's 40 inches in diameter, and you can see that a tiny, relatively tiny ring at the out next year's growth, in other words, uh, matches a fat, fat ring uh, on a very small tree, and you begin to understand why people can be so confused. Because if you look at that and you say, oh my God, that's got to add up to a lot. But if what I do is with using uh, very high-tech equipment and fairly advanced mathematics, we come up with some very good volume uh, determinations. And I won't call them estimates because they go beyond estimating. It's 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 a lot of direct measuring and running through computer models. And so we can come up with a very good, accurate determination of how much volume you would add, let's say, in an additional year uh, if you have this really big tree. And in some species, it grows fairly rapidly, like tulip tree or white pine or whatever, and, and see how that compares to what you might add on with a big fat ring in a relatively small tree. It's not unusual in stand-grown white pines to be able to get a white pine up to about 60 to 80 cubic feet of trunk and limb volume in uh, about 50 years. We, we do this kind of modeling all the time so we can take, okay, the tree's 25 years old, what do you expect it to have if it grows on a good side, if it grows on an average side, if it grows on a poor side, da, da, da. If, if it grows in conjunction with other white pines, et cetera, so it's having a share of nutrients, or is it hogging up those nutrients? We, we run all those scenarios. So let's say that we take a tree that's growing pretty well, and it's got 80 cubic feet in the first 50 years. I have this one tree that we just modeled up in a uh, state forest in Massachusetts. It's a giant. We named it the Henry David Thoreau white pine. It has in its trunk alone, not counting limbs, 900 
and 86 cubic feet, it's under 200 years old. Now, now let's take a look, let's think about that. 80 cubes going into a trunk at 50, by 50 years, in 986, by the time the tree is a little under 200 years, that's an age diff, uh, factor of a little less than four to one. But look at the difference in the volume factor. You know, you divide 986 by 80 and see what that gives you. And you see that you had to have most of the sequestration and volume growth in later years. Well, this is a dominant pine, so we don't draw all of our conclusions from what a dominant tree does. But what I'm telling you is basically not really understood. I walk the forest with professionals, and when I, I challenge them to, okay, tell me what you think is in volume in that particular tree over there, and what do you think it's going to add in another year? How, what do you think the growth curve is going to be and what will it sequester in the next 20 years as opposed to something smaller? That's not something that they typically do. They're yeah. looking at trees in a very different way. And therefore, this is where I'm making, hopefully, my contribution these days. And I have a, I've teamed up since last February with a eminent scientist by the name of Dr. William Muma from Tufts University. He was part of a group that won a Nobel Prize. And he was originally a physical chemist. Uh, but he's, he is a, one of the leading carbon scientists and he's the chair of the board of directors for Woods Hole Research Center. And he and I have developed what we call the, the Bill and Bob uh, road show. <laughs> and what we do is we put on, uh, the Bill and Bob show, which is, is essentially a, uh, PowerPoint presentation in which he has his part and I have my part. And for the most part, he looks at it globally. And even regionally, but but you know over large areas, and deals with the statistics of uh, carbon science and the uh, uptake of where it comes from, what role the oceans play, what role the trees play, how old forests behave relative to young. But then when I come up, then I'll show some pictures of big trees, and then uh, uh, start looking at the modeling process where I explain how we know what we know. And yes, I use the U.S. Forest Service's allometric equations to compute the volume of a tree that has a certain set of dimensions and compare that to what I can calculate using advanced methods and oftentimes even climbing the trees and doing periodic uh, tape wraps or diameter measurements every meter or so, so that we have a lot of data as opposed to a model that averaged a million things out. And oftentimes I find that the traditional models don't work for these older trees in particular because the models were developed on younger plantation grown trees that have a different form. So you get into form class, you get into a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of geeky stuff. But <clears throat> the other side, and I'm talking about the exploitive side, they really don't know any of that stuff. You know, they, yeah. they essentially are living by these slogans. And, and no sooner as somebody said, oh, it's the young forests that do all the work. I can take that apart in the wink of an eye. And I don't get much pushback because in order to push back, they've got to give something other than slogans. And they can't answer a single question that I raise. So I'm hoping and I'm, I'm optimistic that the Bill and Bob Roadshow will, will widen beyond the places that we've taken it so far. And of course, he's the heavyweight, and I'm I'm the the, the geeky engineer to to compute certain things. But mm -hmm. it's been very effective, and in a lot of people's eyes, who were on the right side spiritually, or you know, in terms of their hearts, and they were so, oh my goodness, I never knew that. I didn't understand. I really did think that that if you start off from a absolute zero, no forest, clear cut, or whatnot, and the, the young trees going back in, if you allow to them, that, that they will sequester carbon more rapidly than if you just left whatever was there alone to grow, assuming that it wasn't a dying forest. You know, we always have to have exceptions. We often always have to allow for mitigation. You know, you get the pine yeah. bark beetle, you get the hemlock woolly adelgid, the uh, Asian longhorn beetle, you know, the emerald ash borer. We've always got situations where we may need to enter being and that is that doesn't take any away anything i've said about the role of, of an older forest versus a, a younger one and we make that those points too i'm thinking about um 
edge effects. Is there anything to the idea that I just had that it might grow faster, it might become more, and getting away from just the trees, the forest itself, in terms of biomass and and uh, things that can be transferred, the energy and everything that can be transferred from the old growth that's adjacent to a newly uh, protected plot. Maybe it's been planted a little mm-hmm. bit or other things have been done to, to help it along, um, but it's relying a lot on the old surrounding or edge effect of an old growth forest that's there. Is there anything to the, the regrowth of that that might be accelerated due to a proximity effect? of any kind well well maybe and maybe not if if the old if it's a section out in the a, a large contiguous forest area and you go into the center of it and it's old let's say it's an old growth area to start with and everything blew down for you know 100 acres or so and uh somebody convinced uh the the, the landowner a resource manager to salvage and so you, you you look at it a little later and everything's out of there and they say oh, well we'll plant it back what happens then well okay the depending on how much of the mycorrhizal fungi underground was destroyed and that has a lot to do with what kind of equipment you used and all that sort of thing you might have a fairly good base for growing trees back and they might uh, uh, benefit by the fact that you had surrounding old growth now let's transpose that to an area where the old growth is at the edge of a city park. You know, it's a park and it's got old trees in there and now you've got an edge and you've got all these invasive seed sources from the surrounding neighborhoods. What you're probably going to get are vines. You know, you're going to get all kinds of invasives. Once you open that kind of forest up, what you inherit is not pretty. Mm. Uh, You get uh, kiwi vines killing and strangling trees. You know, you get uh, just all kind of euonymus. You get everything in there that you did not want. And that's been a big problem, but it isn't a uniformly same problem. You have to really think in terms of how much protection you've got the area. So it's really interior. You're better off. But sooner or later, you're going to get some invasives coming in. What we find is in these intact forest areas and for example if you go into the interior of the adirondack wilderness and if you have an opening there you probably aren't even going to find a single invasive plant mm. maybe if you do it's one <clears throat> but on the other hand if it's only at the edge of plattsburgh or someplace like that or down here in massachusetts uh in, in the outskirts of boston oh katie bar the door all you've got is invasive species coming in then you have to manage for them or they, they turn the forest into something that's very different and not very desirable. It's a complicated issue in terms of those things. One of the points I like to make to people who are talking about, well, is it okay if I go ahead and have a little 10-acre patch clear-cut for so I can see more wild turkeys and that sort of thing out there? Well, if you want to inherit barberry and you want to inherit, inherit all of the other plants that come along that you don't want and that's okay with you because you're not really looking at it as a natural environment but one that is uh, created essentially from the stuff that we didn't want go at it but don't look at it as though it's a zero-sum game that you're going to gain uh, only the things you want and not have to go with the other things that you didn't want so to tie this together, I think you've made a brilliant case today on the difference between um, planting a new forest and, and the ability of an old forest, uh, the difference between those in carbon sequestration. When people are doing replanting projects, it seems that you might want to, you might suggest maybe, uh, you can tell me, that the expectation in those kinds of programs should be that we are planting baby old growth forests or some, some sort of term like that so that the stage can be set that we're not going to cut these down in 50 years and we're not going to come from a resource management perspective. Um, and I think, and the only reason I bring that up, some people might wonder why, uh, I think we tend to, in the conservation community, have some of that maybe subliminally rub off on us because we hear so much from, re- we do so much st- research on our own to uh, develop our cases for articles and things like that, that comes from the resource industry. We're monitoring those guys. And I wonder how much of that tends to rub off on us. 
to where we may think in terms of a resource manager more than a conservationist at times, subliminally, not really intentionally at all. So would you say that it would be good if we are doing, if, if um, the rewilding project of, of something in the Amazon or in the Adirondacks or wherever else that we're, we're looking to replant and regrow and rewild a place, that we're doing it under the specific intention of we're, ba- we're planting baby old growth? Because it's really the people 50 years from now who are going to be the ones who are going to either champion the continuation of the protection of that place or fall, succumb to the old resourcism um, that trees need to be cleared out, this forest needs to be managed and things like that. We have to get people on the ground to fall in love with the idea that this forest is forever. Yes, I, I think I couldn't have said it better, Jack. I think you, you put your thumb right on it. And, and I would add only one thing to what you said. If we can, at the same time, give those people a profile of what their forest can be, especially if they watch for invasives, and they might have to take a few mitigating acts along the way. But if, other than that, they leave it alone, we can show them what they can expect at different stages, 25 years out, 50 years out, 100 years out, 300 years out, so that they can see that if they were influenced by the other sources, the exploitative-minded sources, that once it gets up to a certain age, then it's done its job. When it's really just starting to do its job, if we can get that message across, we will have made a huge stride forward. Are you talking about material that's possibly in the road show? Is these charts and things and those those yes. projections sound actually really inspiring and exciting for an audience to yeah. hold? Yes, yes, they are. They are in the road show. And as you can probably guess, Bill is a very sophisticated New Englander, and I'm a, a an ex uh, Air Force uh, hillbilly from Eastern Tennessee. So it, it makes for a combination that's kind of interesting and humorous. <laughs> and I bring I usually a lot of my Southern humor and colloquialisms to it. I remember the last time somebody said something, uh, which was just, it just wasn't true. It, it, it was off. And I just, before I thought, I said, hey, that dog don't hunt. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and I got a laugh out of it, but it was also very serious. So we we combine in in our roadshow we combine uh, his eruditeness and my colloquialness if I've used two terms correctly uh, to the benefit of the message because those kind of messages they can get pretty uh, hard to follow. Bill has some incredibly good slides. One of them, for example, is from uh, data from the U.S. Forest Service. You know the good side of the Forest Service, and it shows carbon density. In, in the maps that are color coded for the Northeast. And in, here's New England. So we see Western Massachusetts and Southern Vermont and a little, some, some of uh, adjacent uh, New Hampshire. And then we see the Adirondacks over there. And they're in this, this very bright, vibrant green. And what does that mean? Well, uh, that means a lot. It means it's, uh, the carbon density is a lot. Then we look at the state of Maine. And for the most part, it's in this unusual shade of pink. And what does that mean? Well, it means there ain't none <laughs> there. Well, it turns out that the ratio, and we're talking about per acre, per unit area, of Western Mass is about three times on their data. And that doesn't include factors that would up the actual number based upon tree size, et cetera. But on their data, we in Western Massachusetts are three times more carbon dense per unit area than they are in Maine. Well, I know many people I've talked to that believe Maine is just this uh, wilderness area up there, uh, you know, acre after acre of of old trees and big trees and whatnot. Uh Uh-uh, no, it isn't. So we have a lot of uh, myth uh, dispelling that we have to do, and he does it supremely and i do it with a southern flair <laughs> <laughs> well there'll be more information anywhere you're listening to this podcast look down look up look to your right there'll be more information on how you might be able to uh bring this marvelous old growth road show to your area to your group um and so i i had uh, a great time 
today, Bob. I wish we had more time because there's so much, uh, so much more we could cover, I'm sure. What are some things on the ground you'd love to see people doing more of to help in your effort? Uh, call on the uh, Bob and Bill show, uh, or Bill and Bob. Whoops, <laughs> got it in the wrong order. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm going to have to talk the, to the Bill. The Bill and Bob show there, the Bill and Bob show, so that we can communicate with gr- groups of people more intimately and make our case face to face. I think the more we're able to do that, the more we have that multiplier effect. We don't know who that person sitting out there is that's shaking their head one way or the other, but let's say we reach them and then they go and do something. I think that's a better route for us than to try to to do it on some, with some other venue, at least for the present. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on Rewilding Earth, Bob. I love it. I, I hope we can uh, actually do this again and continue this discussion. Would love to, Jay. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Rewilding Earth podcast. Be sure to visit rewilding.org to subscribe so you don't miss past and future episodes. And while you're there, please consider supporting Rewilding by making a donation or subscribing to the Rewilding Earth newsletter.